Aren't there enough rule sets for wargaming the American Civil War? Well, there's one more to add to the pile. Osprey is releasing with hot lead and cold steel. So what is so different about these? Well, I have Arthur Vandister, the rules author, with me all the way from the Netherlands. Let's find out why a Dutchman would take on gaming the American Civil War. And does his perspective give us a new set of rules that are something new and exciting? We decided to use them to wargame AP Hill's famous attack at Antietam. Watch for game reports and a battlefield exploration on our channel in the next few weeks. Well, Arthur, thank you so much for joining us here in the game room. We're really excited to talk to you about these brand new American Civil War rules, Hot Lead and Cold Steel. Uh, you were gracious enough to send me kind of an advanced copy uh, so we could try them out. And yeah. so, sure enough, we, we put some figures on the table and ran through it, and it was uh, we had a fun time. There were some unique things, and there were some things that felt familiar to us. Kind of the activation felt a little bit like black powder. Yeah. So my question to you to start is, you know, what do you feel makes this game unique as an American Civil War set of rules? Yeah, that's always a great question. Um, when I decided to, uh, to start writing the rules, I wanted something that was more uh, historical than yeah. your, your generic black powder games. Um, I played a few in in in, uh, in the past few years, um, and, but there was there was always always something missing there. And of course, there are uh, yeah several uh, American Civil War titles. I played a couple of them too, but. I always found them a bit too, either too difficult or way too simple. So I wanted to try to be uh, somewhere in the middle between simplicity and um, and historical accuracy. Um, and um, well, one of the things I, I really wanted to include were was the right terminology. If you order your troops uh, across the table, you can you can move them a double quick or quick time that sort of thing. As a European looking at the American Civil War, like why did, why did you want to do it? What drove you to do a set of rules about that? Well, for those of you who don't know, I'm Dutch. Um, I've lived in the Netherlands for, for, for my entire life. And uh, when I was very little, uh, I, I, my, I have an older brother who uh, he bought one of those ASCII boxes, one in, well, one in 72nd scale figure sets. And uh, he got uh, the Union Infantry set. And for some reason, the uniforms just, I don't know, it just clicked with me. And, um, um, you know, uh, I was about nine years old when, when Glory came out, the movie. The first time when I watched it, I knew in my future I will be doing something with Civil War. Is the game received differently? by his hardcore historical people than it is by, say, fantasy gamers. Because that was a big thing that the author of Men Abroad said. He said, sci-fi gamers, they just love my game. We just have a great time. And historical people get bogged down in yeah. arguing about, this is right. How, how, do you, how do you think people receive your rules? Um, well, I developed the rules. I wrote the rules together. Well, I wrote them by myself, but... We play tested them with my friends, of course, um, and they they have all sorts of backgrounds in in, in historical gaming, uh, 40k. But at the outset, I knew I wanted to write a game that we all would enjoy, and we all had a, would have a sense of yeah, this is a real civil war game, not just um, generic black powder. Um, so that's how the rules came about, and I've since the book has uh, been released. I played it with a couple of people uh, outside of that group. Um, to be honest, most of them are historical gamers. And quite a few of them are hardcore um, Fire and Fury fans, which um, uh, I knew I was going to have a hard time winning over. <laughs> because most Fire and Fury uh, gamers are very passionate about the game. Yeah. Uh, but they, they generally liked it. And... Um, you know they were were positive and and said yeah this is a real civil war game and it's 
it plays fluently and uh, yeah we enjoy it so so let's uh when you say fire and fury it brings back a lot of memories for me right like i've played it and fire and fury there's two versions mm -hmm. there's regimental where each unit is a regiment and then yeah. the original fire and fury is each unit is a brigade right so yeah. the original one you can play gettysburg the new one you're just doing say little round top mm -hmm. tell me about when you were writing this why you decided to do it at the scale you did because you can correct me if I'm wrong but it seems like you want a division or two on the table right like you want multiple brigades so why did you yeah. choose that I, I just love uh, big big games um, to play with you know three four or five people per side and the rules had to reflect that sort of simplicity uh, to be able to play such large games in, in an evening or you know in an, on a Saturday uh, day Right. Uh, so, um, yeah. So kind of like a lifestyle choice, really, that you wanted. You wanted yeah. something big, but you wanted you wanted that granularity, meaning you wanted to say double quick, and that's better represented when there are regiments as opposed to yeah. brigades. That's cool. I hadn't, th I hadn't thought yeah. about that. And there, there's, of course, the, uh, the brigade formations in the book. Right. Yeah. You got your uh, brigade in, in multiple lines, which was often used in, in Civil War battles. Yeah. Brigades in echelon formation, which I don't think you really see in other games. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I I, I have a really interesting book on uh, Civil War tactics, infantry tactics, which uh, was a big uh, source for me. Um, and I really wanted to incorporate really those sort of uh, formations and tactics. I feel like this is a great game to do the opening engagement at Gettysburg, which I'm done, we're going right. to do, because you have essentially two brigades on two brigades. So that's yes. kind of your game right there. And you have the Iron Brigade on one side, so what could be better? Everyone's going to love that. So the game wants to be historical, which is great. You know, it also kind of wants to be fun and light, and you're trying to walk that line, which I think is great. I think that's kind of what modern games really want to do. So one thing like in our club, right, is we never mm -hmm. ever, even rules we write, right, ever play them exactly. Like we're always throwing in our own little rule or yeah. little thing because that's what you do, right? We all have a personality. Yeah. How customizable do you think your game is? Like can a club come in and add their own you know, flavor here and there and will it break the game or is it open to that? Yeah, that, 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 I think I, uh, I put it in there uh, early on in the rules. If, if there's anything you don't like about it, uh, feel free to change it. I mean, even the basing system isn't set in stone. Right. You know, um, I, I make recommendations of, of how to do it and based on my own collection of figures. Yeah. But if, if you have your troops based in a different way, you know, feel free to, to, uh, to create a system around it, it which... The, the, the rules will allow you to do. One thing I would say about regimental level is you have some scenarios in the back. And so yeah. I always go to the scenarios. Okay, what, what is he modeling? What is he expecting me to see? <laughs> and I was kind of shocked in a very pleasant way. And I was like, wow, I really want to play this scenario because yeah. it's Stonewall Jackson's attack at Chancellorsville. And it's just that point where he crushes the yeah. end of the Union line. And I thought that is really great because who would ever game that? Like you usually don't. <laughs> Chancellorsville is so hard to game, but on the scale that you have, it actually be quite an interesting game. You know, the Union knows they're going to take it in the chin, but can they hold? And I thought that was great, and I'm really looking forward to trying trying that out for sure. I, I wanted to include the entire uh, core of, of of Jackson, but it would just mean too many units. Yeah. So uh, uh, I think it's just uh, the first two divisions yeah. that are on the on the flank. Uh, right. So it's it's the initial initial contact by uh, yeah. Jackson's core. Well, I think that's what you have to do in a game at this scale. Yeah. You kind of focus in a little bit, right? Yeah. And I think I think it works. Well, to speak on that, here's a question I have. Um, you talked about how many troops you would need, right? Oh. So these these rules. Uh, I think are open for new gamers or, you know, they're not so dense that 
you know, a new gamer is going to be overwhelmed by them. They can, I think they can get into them and understand it. But there's also a bar to entry with numbers of figures. So for a new gamer, like how many figures do you think they would need to kind of come up with to play a basic game, right? I've been asked that multiple times. <laughs> uh, and I think it all depends on, on the scale you want to play. Right, because you know, if if you want to use the uh, the World of Games epic uh, epic skill stuff, you know, you're you're gonna have a lot more figures, of course, but they're very tiny. Um, yeah, there there's no right or wrong answer. Um, it it all depends on how you want to base and what scale figures. Uh, but I I can imagine it's what one of the reviewers said. It's an ambitious game. You're gonna need quite a bit of troops. Um, but yeah, that's 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 the deal you get. Yeah, that's the sense I got. Right? As you're talking regiments, and you're talking a whole division, there's a lot of regiments, so there might be a bit. So for a new gamer, um, you might want to buddy up with someone that has a lot of figures already, yeah. right? And then kind of uh, kind of go at it that way. Let's just talk a little bit about that scale because that was a huge issue when we did Meta Bronze. Like it was a little bit confusing yeah. to us at the time. Do we do individual figures? Does he want to have, you know, multiple on a base? And, I mean, ultimately what we did is I had, you know, American Civil War based for something else, and I just went by bases. I just said, okay, this yeah. um, regiment has four bases. Each base yeah. takes six hits, and we would just track the hits. And, yeah. I mean, that's the same work very fine, right? So it, it kind of yeah. can work with whatever you have. Is that true? Yeah, you if you didn't want to paint figures, you could use wooden blocks if you paint it either blue or gray. Right. You know? yeah. I've, I've even uh, spoken to someone um, um, who was using 2D figures. So yeah. just uh, an MDF base right. um, with, a, with a printout of, of uh, uh, units viewed from, from above. So okay. you can only see their heads. And right. uh, that's what he uses. Many games we've played in the past two decades, we'll say, right, have gotten away from units taking many hits, right? Yeah. And I noticed in your game, each base, you know, suffers six kind of hits. So yeah. that's like 24 hits in a thing. Just why did you choose to go with a game that used a lot of hit points? Is there any particular reason? or? Uh, yeah, because I wanted to be able to roll a lot of dice. Okay. That's a good reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there there's a lot of games uh, nowadays that that um, that will allow you to either roll one die or maybe three per, per right. unit. Right. And to me, that just doesn't feel like you're actually um, in a firing line. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's something so there's I, something good about rolling a big handful of dice. It yeah. feels like you're shooting a volley, right? <laughs> I'm kind of like that kind of gamer. I want to roll a lot of dice, and um, um, you know, your first roll is is what you get. That that uh, that's the amount of hits you have. So um, by rolling six or eight dice, you really need to have a larger, um, in in this case, what I call unit currency. Right. Um, what other games would call morale or or you know your hit points. Um, well, that's a good, that's a great. That's a great reason. I mean, I like rolling the dice. It does feel like I'm shooting a volley. And if the trade-off is keeping track, you know, because we had to have markers on the table. Um, but, okay, it's a good trade-off, you know. And that's a great thing, I think, to hear from a game designer is it's not all science when you're making games. To me, writing rules is a bit of art, right? And you bring your personality into it. Right, then uh, you just like rolling a lot of dice. You like that feel, and so now yeah. that's what you're giving to people. And it, it, it was just a case of finding the right balance between um, the amount of attacks a unit has and the amount of damage it can suffer. Right. And uh, after a couple of tryouts, I think we've managed to uh, to find that right balance. Yeah. The one thing we felt, um, maybe this is veering into review a little, so forgive me, Arthur, but the one area that my guys, and this is only after one play test, so, you know, mm -hmm. take it for, you know, a grain of salt, but we were intrigued, you know, by the aide-de-camp uh, rules where you're using them to increase your 
the ability to pass orders, which makes great sense. But we just, we felt like you could have done could have done a little more with it. Like it just felt was like you're either going to increase your initiative or increase your chance mm. to have orders. So that might yeah. be an area where our club like add some extra chrome rules yeah. right but it uh, certainly doesn't feel like that would break the game on that the, l the last game i played uh, one of the, uh, the players asked well why can't you just use aid the camps um uh, if you want to uh, rally your troops yeah so we had the same question yeah yeah and i thought i was like yeah well why, why don't i think of that but <laughs> that's maybe something you can house rule i, I mean yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah why not cool. it's, yeah. it's not not difficult to implement and I think there's something good actually in in rules that have a little bit of that open. It's not everything is legislated because then it allows it to be a living set of rules that a club can change. So I think it's really great. Um, what was your? I don't know. Do you have a favorite battle you like to play with these rules? Uh, purely out of, of out of interest, I would say Antietam. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah, because that's I think where the odds were longest for the, the rebels. I mean, um, we, we we talk about this this battle uh, all the time at our club, and um, it's it's just astonishing to know that McClellan had about twenty thousand troops in reserve, yeah. and if he had pushed them forward, the, the war would have been over. Um, so. From that viewpoint, that's that's the most interesting battle to play. Yeah, uh, I, I'm fascinated by that battle as well. So maybe we'll um, find part of that to do as a game, and uh, we'll play. I actually just bought a book called "The uh, Maps of Antietam," which is a great mm. a great book in detail at the scale you're talking about. It lays out each regiment. Yeah. So I'm gonna pick part of that, and we'll see. I was thinking maybe the end of the battle where Burnside has broken through, and AP Hill's division yeah. comes in and counterattacks. I mean, it feels like your set of rules is perfect for that moment, right? Because you have one division kind of hitting another division. So that would be Yeah, cool. Burnside would probably, his troops would come um, across the river uh, fatigued, with yeah. several fatigue penalties already on, on them. And um, AP Hill maybe as well because of their forced march. Well, Arthur, um, do you have anything in the pipeline? Are you, get, are you working on anything new or... You know, you got a scenario book coming out, or what are you doing in your gaming life? Um, well, in terms of with Hotland and Cold Steel, I'm just trying to keep it, keep it alive. Um, one of the criticisms I've heard about the Blue Book series is a lot of a lot of the authors they don't support the rules anymore when they get released, and uh, that's not my intention. I want to keep it alive and uh, you know develop it further. Um, there is another scenario for the wilderness that didn't make the final uh, print okay. because there were just not not enough room. Um, so we will just uh, publish it on uh, on Facebook or on the, the website of Osprey. When is it coming out in the U.S. The hard copy? Yeah, strange enough, um, late January. Okay. All right, okay. For whatever reason, um, it was released in in the rest of the world on October twenty sixth. And North America, for whatever reason, um, late January. I think. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Arthur. And thank we'll, you for uh, having me. Yeah, thanks. You. We look forward to playing your game. All right. Take care. <laughs>